your patience. Um, we're just going to give this another minute so people can enter the Zoom room and then we'll go ahead and get started. Hola, hola, muy buenas tardes a todos. Vamos a darnos un minuto para terminar de llegar al espacio y luego vamos a comenzar. Thank you for the tip, Erin. All right. Um, a few more people are trickling in. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. I'm going to pass uh, the mic over to interpreters for a quick announcement. Eh, hola, hola, le voy a pasar la palabra a las intérpretes para un anuncio breve. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Alexia. Estoy aquí con mi compañera Javi. Vamos a estar interpretando la conversación del día de hoy entre el inglés y el español utilizando la herramienta de interpretación de Zoom. So, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexia. I'm going to be uh, interpreting today with my colleague Javi. And we're going to be using the Zoom interpreting tool. Entonces, ahorita ya está activada. Pueden ver un pequeño icono en forma de globito que va a aparecer, que, es, que aparece en la parte inferior de su pantalla si están en una computadora. So the function is activated um, already. So you can see a little uh, icon in the shape of a globe that's going to be at the bottom of your screen. You click there and then you select your language channel, uh, English or Spanish, if That's if you are on a computer. Entonces, pueden seleccionar su canal de idioma, ya sea el inglés o el español, si están en una computadora. Si les pedimos que por favor seleccionen un canal de idioma si no se sienten 100% cómodos en los dos idiomas, ya que vamos a estar utilizando los dos activamente en el espacio. So we do ask you that if you, not, if you don't feel 100% comfortable in both languages, to please select a channel because we are going to be Uh, using both languages actively in this space today. Si están uniéndose a través de una tableta o de un teléfono, el botón va a ser un poquito diferente. Es donde dice more o más, que tiene tres puntos. Le dan clic ahí. Después al menú de interpretación de idiomas y luego al canal inglés o español. Uh, if you are joining us via a tablet or a smartphone, it's going to look a little bit different. It has a three dots. It says more. You click there and then you go to the uh, language interpretation drop down menu and then you select English or uh, Spanish. Eh, si les pedimos, por favor, que si participan, lleven un paso moderado al hablar. Eh, si necesitamos que hablen más despacio, les haremos saber vía la cajita del chat. Eh, y creo que eso es todo por nuestra parte. So uh, we do ask you to please a moderate pace when you are speaking. And if we need you to slow down, we will let you know via the chat box. And I think that is it from our end. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, please let us know and we will be very happy to answer them or help you out. Eh, muchas gracias. Si tienen alguna pregunta o cualquier cosa, nos pueden hacer saber y les podremos ayudar. Thank you so much, Alexia. Um, so right now I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic to our main sponsor for this event, uh, the Bibliographical Society of America. Uh, thanks so much for being here, Erin. Hi. We're excited to pick up the Radical Publishing in Mexico City series. Um, and thank you, TK, for getting everything organized. I'm the executive director of BSA, and I'm happy to welcome everyone here. Just a couple of housekeeping reminders. First of all, this event is being recorded. And as a participant today, you do agree to abide in the BSA code of conduct. So I'm just popping a link to that in the chat if you have any questions about our community agreement, creating space to talk and learn together. 
Uh, today's event will conclude with a question and answer period. To submit a question to our speaker, please enter it into the Q&A box. You can enter it in Spanish or in English, whichever language you're most comfortable with. And um, all attendees can see, comment on, and upvote questions. And we ask that you do this to help us prioritize que questions of greatest interest to today's audience. I also want to encourage you to engage in conversation using Zoom's chat feature, but if you submit a question via the chat, I'm going to ask you to re-enter it into the Q&A box. So finally, I'm going to hand it over to TK and first introduce her. TK Sangwand is a certified archivist, librarian, and DJ. She is currently the librarian for digital collection development at UCLA Library and holds an MLS and an MA in Latin American Studies from UCLA. Over the past 12, 12 years, she has worked at both UCLA and UT Austin to build preservation partnerships for human rights documentation and cultural heritage materials in the US, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. In 2017, she was named a Fulbright Specialist in Library and Information Science, and in 2018 and 2019, she was a Fulbright Scholar with Mexico's Ministry of Culture. She is currently a 2020 through 2022 Rare Book School slash Mellon Fellow, Mellon Foundation Cultural Heritage Fellow. And since 2001, TK has worked in community radio and currently hosts the program, The Archive of Feelings on DoubleLab.com. So thanks for organizing this today, TK, and the mic is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Erin, and thank you for your support of this event. Uh, so welcome everyone. Thanks for your patience um, as we got started a little bit late. Um, and thank you for attending this fifth installment of the Radical Publishing in Mexico City speaker series. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, I'll just give you a brief background on the aim of this series. Uh, we want to highlight creative bibliographic research and practice originating in Mexico City and highlight transnationalism in bibliographic studies and tie bibliographic history to the current sociopolitical context. As a current Rare Book School Fellow, I organize this series with the aim to decenter Global North Productions in Rare Book, artist book and bibliographic discourse and highlight some of the important politically and aesthetically relevant work happening in the global south. Uh, if you miss the past talks or if you want to revisit them, you can check them out at the Bibliographical Society of America's YouTube page. And I'll drop a link in the chat, which has uh, its information about the series and it also links you to the past talks. Um, of course, none of this would be possible without the support of many organizations and individuals. Uh, again, I want to give a huge thanks to the Bibliographical Society of America for having funded this entire series and uh, give thanks to the California Rare Book School for supporting this latest installment. Uh, I also want to thank my home institution of UCLA Library for co-sponsoring and especially my colleague Susie Lee, who has ran all the technical logistics for the series. And last but not least, I want to thank Alexia and Javi, who will be interpreting this event so it can be made available to a broad audience. And of course, a big thanks to all of y'all for showing up today on Zoom. Um, I know it's been a long several years of Zooming, so appreciate that there's still interest in, in coming here. Um, so Again, if you have any technical issues with accessing the interpretation, just send a message in the chat and we'll try to help you. Um, if you'd like to tweet about the event, please use the hashtag RadPubCDMX and I'll also drop everyone's social media handles in the chat. Um, so we'll talk for about 35 minutes. Uh, Macarena will give her talk and then we'll leave some time for Q&A afterwards. And if you have any questions, just send them at any time via the Q&A box in either Spanish or English, whichever language is most comfortable for you. And at the very end of the program, I'll ask you to uh, fill out a quick two question evaluation saying what you appreciated about the event and what could have gone better for you. And this will really help uh, plan for future happenings. So I'll drop the link in the chat early in case um, anyone has to leave before the end. And so now without further ado, uh, it's an honor to present our speaker for today. Macarena Hernandez is an art historian, editor and cultural producer. She graduated from the Universidad Iberoamericana with a degree in art history and a master's in critical theory from the 17 Instituto de Estudios Críticos. In 2015, she co-founded Eromoto, a public library in Mexico City specializing in art and independent publishing, where she continues to collectively produce public programming. 
Hernandez is currently editing the Pabellón de México and La Bienal de Venecia, which is coming out later this year. And she was recently an invited curator for the Poetry Aloud Festival, Language Before Words, um, in 2020 at the Casa del Lago Juan Jose Ariola, which is part of the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, or UNAM. And over the years, Hernandez has also developed the print and digital editorial agenda. Okay, I don't want to interrupt you, but can you speak slower, please? Thank you. Yes. Sorry about that. Um, over the years, Hernandez has also developed the print and digital editorial agenda for the Museo Experimental El Eco, in addition to developing a virtual exhibition on the pedagogy of art and architecture. She has also edited Ediciones Eco, a series of publications on contemporary artists inspired by concrete poetry. And additionally, Macarena organizes workshops and talks on experimental poetry, imaginary libraries, and Eromoto. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Macarena. Thank you so much for being here today. Ay, no, gracias a ustedes por la, por la invitación. Thank you all so much for the invitation uh, to TK and to the Biographic Society of America and everyone else who is present here, the institutions who are uh, who made this possible behind the scenes, everybody who, who made this possible. Thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about Aeromoto. It is a public library in the city of Mexico. I'm sorry that I'm just switching my uh, gaze. I couldn't open my notes here with you all because there are some images I want to share with you. So I'm going to have to be switching. I want to tell you more about Aeromoto. I'm going to cite about three books from the collection Aeromoto collection and also share with you a little bit of that experience. I'm going to share my screen now. Where is it again? Oh. Well, I don't know why I can't set up the images quite right, but well, let's see. I'm going to put them up this way. Well, another thing that I'd like to highlight is that Aeromoto is a collective uh, effort. I'm going to present it today, but there's various folks who are a part of this project, some people who are permanent participants or uh, who have been working uh, on this for years or a few months. Like I said, it is a collective effort. I want to just highlight that this is a, a, a not a loan effort. Um, this is at the prehistoric center, uh, thanks to the Seminario 12 project, uh, that we are able to be present there. Uh, it's how we are able to exhibit the collection here. The first site says, leave the store with holding the book together. Who has stolen the book if it's 10 people who have are holding it? And this is a, an excerpt from David Horvitz of how how to steal books from Gato Negro editor. I want to tell you a little bit about the story. Uh, Aeromoto in its beginnings, it begins in 2015 with Uh, the Mauricio Mercin and Veronica Reddy uh, collections. And let's say these are four archives become public. And we gathered uh, 1,200 books because a lot of friends wanted to contribute to, to their archives and other institutions began to um, for this initiative. And well, this gesture is a, is a, a sign of resistance uh, against an excessive capitalism that really takes over our lives and also 
and also to the marketing logic logic that really have an impact in our, our, the ways that we relate to the world or with people. And so little by little and year by year, uh, we have more institutions and artists who join us and people who are, have a cultural influence in our community with the goal to continue to grow this collection uh, through donating books and also uh, being actively active and partly participating in the program. I want to just say that during this presentation, I am talking more about the archive. There are many other things. It's a, it's a very, it's a vast um, project and many other creative forms to share books, but I want to focus more today on the, on the collection to, to have a connection to all those folks who are joining us today and, and with BSA. The collection focuses on contemporary art, visual art, poetry, and we set specific goals in independent publishing houses and independent artists because for the most part, it's these are projects that present current current issues um, that are not necessarily being exhibited by uh, the mainstream culture. Um, we say that uh, while we collect these pieces, Aeromoto is considered as an archive of the present time. It collects fragments or these books uh, on speeches or rather uh, documents these and, and the joy in that. I'm gonna read the next um, quote. When the memory of a series of events no longer has a support group when it disperses into individual spirit, spirits lost in the, the new societies, then the only medium to preserve is to fix, fix them in writing because our thoughts and feelings sort of die, but the writing is preserved. And this is a book that is edited uh, Hijo de la Huizote Publishing House, and it is called uh, The Streets of Work While Some Sleeps. Like I said before, the library really is sustained mainly through donations. And while, I'm sorry, and these are exhibited in different events, uh, they, they take different shapes and forms of uh, that the collaborators um, have for it. The goal of these events is to go beyond just uh, uh, exhibiting the, the published work, but it's more like so socializing the, the printed work. And it's funny because uh, throughout this process is almost like these uh, events sort of self schedule themselves. We started connecting with some publishing houses, etc. And little by little, the community has been asking for space for the space and to present their own projects. And it has worked really sort of like a, it's a very self reliant and so we receive emails and we can go ahead and schedule events and so that um, that is what the library is conceived as, as an open space right um, a, a place of gathering and an and encounter with one another and also allows us to think about uh, to this side of this public side to the library not only public in the sense that you can walk through it and take one take a book home and, and, and borrow it and, and more like 
and, and really public because it is supported by the community and not, not, not that the government has um, has not been a supportive an important support but rather the the public also has a say in the operations of the library this is another picture of the our current space um, along those lines I we invite collaborators to uh, to e e exhibit some of the work that Iron Moto Boots has published. We have used this space to invite editors, poets, writers, researchers, teachers or professors, a lot of cultural agents in the city, artists and such. And also with the goal in mind to not have uh, just one voice, right? Uh, we are the ones who, who decide what gets exhibited, but also we wanna hear from community and for them to have a say in what, what gets exhibited in the library. Some of the programs, the acquisition programs, uh, we have generated a, a few of the programs. For example, there's the curated tables or mesas curadas, which was the first program that we we did when we launched the, the library in 2015. We invited an editor, an artist uh, to purchase the the books and we we called them uh, curated tables. There have been other cases where other programs uh, it's called Pedagogias Infinitas, uh, infinite pedag pedagogies. Not only teachers, professors, but uh, artists or people who are in uh, in some way related to pedagogy and also researchers and such, but people who really have a close relationship to um, to library and to select books that weren't uh, available necessarily in the in their libraries. This collection really means a lot to the Aramoto Library. There have been other programs that are a little more complex, um, like a program that we did in collaboration with Object Notes, a collective that is based in uh, Germany, and it was uh, focused on how to create art, uh, handmade art, uh, within contemporary the art framework, um, it, the, really the production of art. It was really interesting because this program also included a series of events like talks, um, visits to studios, artist studios, etc., and also talks with uh, art producers. We we would work with uh, mud and ceramics while we were having those talks and really all of the topics of these conversations had to do with that. And we invited different artists, uh, editors and writers and to also seek material that really was focused on handmade, um, handmade art. And another way, this is the first um, quote that I read. Another way, uh, to expose the library for, for or for the community to sort of carry out the, the 
the library is or those um, books in residence. So how that works is that we invite, but also I want to mention that people come and, ex and bring us their books and they want to exhibit their books. That has really been a really beautiful uh, thing where we had uh, this Sandra Valenzuela, who's an, a writer and artist. Uh, or our dear friend Diego Perez, uh, um, the, the landscape design. And another artist um, who shared with us uh, For a project that we have in residency right now that's focused on drawing. So we have a, that a collection of drawing books. And we offer this a variety in Aeromotos, a collection. And, you know, we offer a different editions and different topics. Uh, it is, you know, precisely, it generates a deep uh, relationships among people that want to lend their books and Aeromoto. So uh, you start to generate community in that way. And I'm going to uh, read another quote. Instead of seeking uh, success that slingshots uh, competitive careers, we think that we should organize moder modest events in which the organizers, uh, we define collectively what we believe to be relevant and urgent. And we should also seek uh, exchange exchanges that are uh, equitable with the participants and we uh, undo the exploitative uh, dynamics. Instead of insisting on the importance of collectivity, we think that we have to practice. This is from uh, Invasorix, which is a queer feminist manual. And well, this is an image, for example, of one of the events that we had in Laura Nipso Borucas. And that was an event for uh, the youth and for girls. Uh, here it is. It is in the a patio, the museum, everyone who gathered. And it is not necessarily that we, uh, I don't know, though, it doesn't really, we don't plan things uh, on long, the long term, but we always follow this self-reflective process and very in touch with the context in which we are placed. Uh, we uh, think of our own context to be able to uh, and make sense. And uh, beyond just accumulating books, uh, we uh, find belonging in having all those artist books and zines and small press uh, uh, books that maybe publications that don't have that uh, don't have a, a place online or elsewhere. And I think that the most important thing is to consider those uh, things as a common space and how uh, objects uh, can lead to a social encounters. I think that is uh, Aeromoto's uh, vision and this is the uh, first uh, establishment that we had in Colonia Juarez in Mexico. We had that uh, little garden there. It was really nice. It was really fun. Uh, instead of a car, a park there, we uh, set up a garden and we just gathered there. Uh, so, uh, uh, to this day, we keep uh, thinking or we think of ourselves as a space, as a library, and, and at the personal level, we have uh, 
made a uh, space for talks. We are thinking about redistributing the materials from the library and also the symbolic character of Airomoto and this redistribution, uh, this symbolic character, yes. Uh, we are also very aware that we are part of a cultural ecosystem in the city. And that is why we uh, like, or we uh, really question ourselves and how to draw that uh, back to all the agents that have visited us and generated programming. And it is, you know, now that we can go visit them to put it in a different way. So it is in uh, the spirit of re reciprocity, right? Or just sharing goods and how our resources that, you know, our books or the bibliographical uh, logistics. I don't know if it can propose economies, but uh, solidary uh, logics or uh, just alternative relationships, alternative uh, exchanges to a system that uh, it's centralized instead. And I am going to uh, read this book. This is called The New Chronicles of uh, Pulque and uh, Vagancia. It says, I do not like to measure a time to count what cannot be counted. I do not know why, but I feel like we've met before. I don't have time. I have no remedy. I don't have money. I'm not interested in worldly treasures. I prefer the wind and his breeze, eyes, ears, noses, mouths, teeth, tongue, soul. I prefer to walk aimlessly. Um, it, uh, it dawned again. And this is a page from an artist book. From Tatiana Musi. And when she presented this publication, we had a circle at the library and she shared her uh, diary with us while we read her uh, drawings. This is a really gorgeous uh, watercolor book. And while we were going over the book, she was reading her a diary when uh, she made those drawings, basically. And this is Aeromotos Ex Libris and Labor Ipse Voluptas above. And this was a beauty salon. So we invite uh, poets, uh, foreign poets that are just passing by uh, in this city to uh, do uh, readings of the work in Aeromoto. And then we also invite literary translators and poets to uh, interpret the uh, works of the foreign poets. Kitsch Luther is the organizer at Tatiana Litkes. And well, these are, uh, you know, fortuitous. It's like whoever shows up and we organize these sessions fairly quickly. And these are some books that Abraham Cruz Villegas uh, bought for uh, the section of infinite uh and teachings and a lot of them are not uh longer in print this is why we managed to uh get them and then we photocopied them uh, for the library And this is the uh, excerpt that I read from the Queer a Feminist Manual, Manual Feminista Queer. Mm -hmm. 
And well, I don't know. I would also like to hear from you and hopefully we can engage in conversation. I believe that we, uh, or maybe there are some details that I'm forgetting to uh, mention. So I would uh, love to listen from you all if you want to, you know, learn something about how Aeromoto works and the acquisitions. Uh, this would be a great time to invite more questions and yeah, have a have a broader conversation as Macarena invites us to. Um, I, I'll start us off, you know, I'm always so impressed by seeing how vibrant and dynamic Eromoto is as a public library. Um, it's definitely not your traditional library where people are silent and just reading. Um, you know, people read, but it's in community and there's a lot of conversation. I'm curious how the pandemic impacted the work that Eromoto does. And I know you guys had a switch to uh, the space in Centro and how that change of space um, has impacted the programming that you do. Mm -hmm. um, sí, no, la pandemia fue muy, muy tremendo, ¿no? So uh, the pandemic was, it was big. So it really uh, forced us, I mean, multiple spaces had to close down uh, temporarily. It also uh, brought us to look for an alternative uh, venue because Aeromoto, I mean, it requires uh, a lot of labor and effort, right? So economic and work. So basically we were not able to pay rent. And it was really beautiful in uh, uh, one way to see that uh, several institutions and uh, colleagues, they were offering us uh, a space to host the library or uh, a warehouse or a museum or uh, the space we uh, were uh, at today, Seminario 12, Seminary uh, uh, 12. Cesar and Carolina, they just opened their doors uh, very generously and they uh, helped us uh, to uh, coexist. So projects coexist there. And it also brought us to uh, reestablish these logics that uh, for, I mean, social, social ones, right? Because we needed to uh, bring our bodies and we love these encounters and we love to reinvent the programs so we could make some of them happen via uh, online. And uh, truthfully, we uh, tried to just put a stop on the program so then we could after uh, do them uh, in, in person. And it was very limited, uh, Mexico City. I mean, at the beginning it was very close, but then after, you know, we had some permits and it was extremely controlled, but uh, I think we bet <coughs> in uh, uh, waiting and then reestablishing those physical uh, contacts and also simultaneously have online programs that could maybe, they were lighter. For example, the drawing uh, program that was a novelty program online on uh, YouTube. And uh, we were interviewing uh, artists and it was a lighter and more fun program. We also did some talks and yes, I don't know, it was less dense. And I, I think that, you know, we had other programs to, and we wanted to uh, uh, just do them when we were able to get together in person again. Um, which I think kind of brings us to the beginning of the project, like where did the name Eromoto come from and what's the significance? Ah, okay. Pues viene, um... So it uh, comes from uh, a book that's called Temblor del Cielo, Earthquake from the, uh, the Skies. And we were actually looking for a word that implied agitation and thought and reflection 
that is where aeromoto comes from because i don't know uh our uh more intuitive et etymology we thought that aero and moto implies movement and an earthquake from the heavens or the sky so it really communicated uh it, it's a reflection of all the mexican poets from the 20th century that wanted to include the city in other elements such as poetry to um, renovate a posture of a contemporary poetry. I mean, Aeromoto comes from that. I think that if, you know, want to, we can also talk about like, I don't know, uh, flying motorcycles or something, but it just uh, comes from the Estridentistas. Um, we do have a question um, from Erin from BSA, um, and she says, I'm curious to know more about Eremoto readers. Public libraries in the U.S. are often used by families and children, for example. Does Eremoto have a typical reader or library user? Mm, okay. Pues, creo que ahí sí estamos muy vinculados como al contexto del arte contemporáneo. I think we're very connected to the context of contemporary art and um, students and teachers uh, art. Almost all the programs are ran within the cultural context in Mexico or all of the, our readers have some sort of relationship with uh, Mexican culture. And yes, there are family programs. There's a program called Tertulias Aeromoto, which is it's like a very fun program. We get families together, parents, um, children, and each person uh, brings an idea or some medium art medium and, and in Aeromoto we sort of invent something out of that uh, we started with like uh, with another project called Pequeño Misterios Little Mysteries um, and it's been really beautiful because in that process we the children begin to make friends you know a group begins to develop and there is sort of a, what develops is like a co-parenting collective or network. So it's a really, it's a very like diverse program. And also it becomes a space for parents, mom, dads, to talk, to vent, to, to talk about motherhood, parenthood in general, and for children to be, to gather. And, and, and so we have that, that small section of children's literature uh, and, and children love it and they're happy with it. And it is basically really, it's people that attend a remote programming. We also uh, have a question from Jan. How have you been able to finance um, Aeromoto Open year after year? This is a really great question, but really because for independent spaces <clears throat> here in Mexico City and surely maybe other places, we began with putting in our own money and our own time. And we also started to apply for grant, art grants, private grants like Publicación Cumex and the uh, contemporary art sponsorships. And we really feel very grateful to them because we, we exist because of them. And we also um, apply for FOCA, which is a state grant uh, with the Secretary of Culture Affair, Cultural Affairs. And we also have done fundraising kind of like with a with a specific uh, amount uh, goal in time uh, for example to fund like a year and a half um, program but that is a really great question yeah, for me personally now that i think about how the community can uh, 
really take ownership of the library i really think about that right like how to take ownership of the financial aspect of the administrative aspect yeah, our programs are very community based but there are other aspects to the library where uh, to really we can invite community members and that, that that it's not also a draining experience but it's rather something that feels good to give but but it, it does take a lot of effort a lot of support and also our own our own capital per se a related question in a way um so i've really appreciated how Iremoto positions itself as an anti-capitalist project. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned a little bit about how, you know, Eremoto's currency is books, for mm -hmm. instance, and it's mm -hmm. uh, knowledge of bibliographic practices. Mm -hmm. um, so you briefly mentioned a program or a collaboration that you have with teachers who can mm -hmm. come to Eremoto and use books that they don't have in their own learning centers. Can you talk a little bit more about that and mm -hmm. the impact that you've seen that have um, with these different youth groups? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, so I think that it was a very like, uh, there's some syn synchronity. Yeah, I'm sorry if I have, uh, I have the window open and there's some noise, you don't hear it? Okay. There was a teacher uh, doing a class in Aeromundo. Uh, he's an art uh, teacher with uh, his students. And I was also speaking with another teacher regarding uh, feminist art uh, from another institution. And I was just asking her, please uh, give me recommendations. And then they were talking about with another teacher in the class. It's like, well, how to, wondering how to include more teachers in the program. And, and 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 a sense of ownership, et cetera, and having all these kinds of conversations that we're always having. And it was very funny how, um, how for this project to be like, you know, to house, that can house publications that, that other places don't have. It is one of the, the most um, requested uh, collection. So uh, it's also funny because we invite teachers to, who are artists in the case of Agram Villegas, but also Guillermo Santa Marina also got invited and he brought us four different artists books. Everybody brings us a great books and and he only brought some folks by artists like Ryan Eno and some other artists, but some gems truly that really he only had enough to bring four, four uh, books. But this is how you really can see and realize uh, every um, specific input that each teacher can bring to the space, right? Because of their own perspective and experience and what that brings into the space fuel Eromoto and its collections. Um, with that, I think we're actually at time. Um, so thank you so much for being with us today, Macarena, and for sharing more about the work that you do with Eromoto. Um, I highly recommend for anyone who's visiting Mexico City, you can check out Eromoto. It's a public library, as Macarena was saying, uh, and it's located in the Centro Histórico. Check them out on Instagram um, to learn more about their work. Um, and thank you for everyone uh, for attending today and hope to see you soon. Ay, muchas gracias por la invitación. Y los vemos Thank pronto. you so much for the invite and we'll see each other soon. Bye, goodbye.